Good day, everyone. Uh, welcome to this edition of the Asia Impact Webinar. Today's webinar marks the launch of the new book entitled Redefining Strategic Routes for Financial Resilience in ASEAN Plus 3. May I invite Jules Veglich, OIC, and Deputy Chief Economist of the Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department of ADB for the opening remarks. Welcome everyone to the launch of the new ADB publication, Redefining Strategic Routes to Financial Resilience in ASEAN Plus 3. This report examines progress in regional financial cooperation among the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, and the Plus 3 economies of the People's Republic of China, Japan, and the Republic of Korea. The report also covers pressing issues for the future of regional financial cooperation and possible solutions. ASEAN Plus 3 has come a long way since the region was struck by a devastating financial crisis about 25 years ago. In the wake of the crisis, the ASEAN Plus 3 governments, with support from the Asian Development Bank and other partner institutions, embarked on an ambitious regional financial agenda to protect from future shocks. Among the most vital initiatives, the Regional Financial Safety Net System, notably the Chiang Mai Initiative Multilateralization, or CMIM, and ASEAN Plus 3 Macroeconomic Research Office, or AMRO, was established and upgraded. Programs that aim to deepen the local currency bond markets and develop capital markets have also been rolled out. Against the rapidly changing global financial landscape, collective effort remains crucial to reinforce the region's policy buffers and trust in its financial systems. Such efforts are even more pressing to pave the way for robust and inclusive socioeconomic recovery from the pandemic. To support this process, the Asian Development Bank and AMRO, which celebrates its 10th anniversary this year, joined forces in two publications. The first joint publication, Trauma to Triumph, Rising from the Ashes of the Asian Financial Crisis, was launched a week ago in AMRO's anniversary event. That volume assesses the major financial development and integration issues since the Asian financial crisis. Today, we launched the second volume of this joint effort, which offers valuable policy lessons for the path ahead to deepen financial cooperation in ASEAN Plus 3. Today's webinar offers food for thought on how to further improve the financial initiatives in place and strengthen the capabilities of regional institutions. The distinguished panel will explore avenues for further regional financial cooperation, such as fintech, pension systems, and sustainable finance. In closing, I would like to thank AMRO for giving us the opportunity to collaborate with them on this research initiative. Uh, there are substantial gains to be made from continued collaboration between our institutions as we endeavor to strengthen regional financial cooperation in ASEAN Plus 3 economies. With that, let me turn the microphone back to the MC. Roger? Thank you very much, Joe, for that opening remarks. Uh, may I now turn over the mic to Sinyang Park, Director of Regional Cooperation and Integration, to provide an overview of the new publication and to moderate the panel discussion. Over to you, Sinyang. Thanks, Lord. Thanks, Roger. Um, so. Nearly 25 years ago, the ASEAN Plus 3 region was hit hard by a crisis. This financial crisis was a blessing in disguise in many ways. It provided a strong impetus to solidify regional cooperation efforts and help institutionalize the financial safety net system in the region. While we have made a very uh, visible progress in the region's financial stability and resilience. Pandemic has yet again exposed structural weaknesses to the region's financial systems while placing them under renewed strains. Good thing is that the shortcomings spotlighted during the pandemic can offer another opportunity for us to step up efforts to collectively tackle these. Here are some areas of priority which are drawn from the new book let me first look at the banking risks. Although banks were generally in the shape when the pandemic hit in 2020, growing non-performing loans could give rise to financial distress as monetary and fiscal policy support 
wind down. The pandemic impact has led to a deterioration in credit quality of many non-financial borrowers. The region also remains highly vulnerable to the concentration of cross-border borrowing from the regional and global banks. This is also happening when greater sophistication in international financing activities of regional firms can also obscure the sources of increased external vulnerability. The regional regulatory cooperation should be further strengthened to guard against the region-wide slow burn contagion through deepened banking networks. New challenges and opportunities are also emerging from fintech and climate finance. Pandemic has accelerated the shift toward fintech activities. Fintech can offer benefits in terms of greater efficiency, transparency, convenience, and financial inclusion. But there are also risks. We have a need to balance the benefits of financial innovation with possible costs and risks involving financial stability, consumer protection, cybersecurity, data privacy, and measures to tackle money laundering and terrorism financing. These areas require greater international cooperation in the development of legal, regulatory, and supervisory frameworks, monitoring capital flows, harmonizing the standards, and better sharing of the data. Regulators also need to recalibrate their policy frameworks to better deal with specific types of systemic and contagion risks arising from the interconnected activities of big tech firms across multiple sectors in various jurisdictions. The region is also facing a substantial financing gap for infrastructure investment, especially if climate mitigation and adaptation de demands are factored in. As we prepare to chart a path toward an inclusive and sustainable recovery, strong regional cooperation is needed to mobilize far more stable sources of long-term finance and greater efficiency in financial intermediation to meet the region's long-term investment needs. Mobilizing private sector capital for funding renewable energy and low carbon transition remains an acute challenge in the region. Despite the recent surge in interest in green bonds, risks remain about the greenwashing and the lack of generally accepted standards about what constitutes environmental, social, and governance investment. Regional cooperation could help develop standards and other measures to facilitate the development of green and climate finance. Finally, some structural challenges remain unaddressed. The dominance of the US dollar as an invoicing and reserve currency and in external financing continue to present significant challenges to regional economies. As Exchange rate flexibility has limited capacity to insulate many of these economies from external shocks. While some regional economies, especially China, Japan, and Thailand, have taken important steps to internationalize their local currencies, they have not made significant headways. However, there are some signs that some regional currencies are increasingly being used for trade among ASEAN plus three economies and with the European Union. Policy actions could help nudge this trend forward. While reducing the region's US dollar dependence must remain an objective for the medium to long term, the immediate objective should be to develop a region-specific integrative policy framework that promotes macro-financial stability in US dollar-dominated financial systems. Second is the rapid population aging in many ASEAN plus three economies, which has major implications for the management of public and private pension systems. 
This is particularly true in China, Japan, Korea, Singapore, and Thailand, where old age dependency ratios are rising sharply. Despite the scale of pension coverage and sustainability as an issue, there appears to be little discussion about it at the regional level. This is worrisome from the perspective of uh, social welfare and macroeconomic stability as unsustainable pensions and rising contingency liabilities may spark a fiscal crisis in one country with spillover effects to neighboring countries. On a positive note, pension funds with large assets under management are potential source of demand that could help facilitate the development of local currency bonds. We are very pleased to have all with you today and also happy to have uh, distinguished speakers who are also the editors and authors of the book. Let me um, introduce our panelists. First, we have Mr. Diwa Gunigundo, former deputy governor of the Banco Central in Filipinas. Mr. Diwa served the BSP for more than 40 years. He was previously designated as an alternate executive director at the IMF and the head of research at the Southeast Asian Central Bank's research and training center called CISEN Center. He also chaired a CSEN task force on CSEN membership and executive meeting of uh, uh, e, uh, East Asia and the Pacific, EMEA, Monetary and Financial Stability Committee, and CSEN experts group on financial uh, flows and the ASEAN senior level committee on financial integration. Professor Masahiro Kawai is also with us today. He is a representative director and director general, economic research institutions for Northeast Asia. He previously served as the Dean and CEO of ADBI and the head of the Office of Regional Economic Integration at ADB. And prior to those, he was a chief economist for the World Bank, East Asia and the Pacific region and the deputy vice minister for International Affairs at Japan's Ministry of Finance. He also taught economics at the Johns Hopkins University and at the University of Tokyo. And finally, we have Ms. Gloria Pasadila today with us. She's a partner and director at Leadership Design Studio. She has over 20 years of experience working in international organizations, government, academia and research institutes. She also wrote many books and research papers on regional financial uh, integration. And uh, she was a senior analyst at the APEC policy support unit in Singapore, worked previously at the ADBI in Tokyo as well. So um, to our distinguished Guests and speakers, welcome. Let me take this opportunity to thank you uh, for joining us today. So can I uh, invite uh, the DG Diwa? So you are directly involved in um, the uh, crisis responses and then the monetary policy making as a central banker during the past crisis experiences. Can you share with us key policy challenges back then? Are we fully overcome these challenges? Well, thank you very much, uh, Sin Yong, for this uh, wonderful invitation. Now, let me clarify that uh, in the run up to the crisis, Asian economies uh, appeared to be growing quite strongly. In more ways uh, than one, the region's macroeconomic fundamentals were quite robust. However, uh, this is not to dismiss the existing macroeconomic imbalances that were obtaining at the time, including high 
external borrowings, fixed exchange rate, and weak financial institutions, as well as uh, regulatory oversight. So the first policy challenge was what to do when the crisis was uh, immediately triggered by speculative attacks and loss of market confidence. It's very difficult to, um, you know, it's very difficult to uh, achieve market confidence, but it's easy to lose it. Um, so my first uh, point here is that our open capital account, well, we all of, most of us are trying to open up our capital account, well, attracted foreign exchange inflows in earlier times to fund business and uh, financial activities. But that also led to financial vulnerabilities like credit boom and asset price uh, inflation. Second is uh, cheap funding. Now, this emboldened many businessmen and uh, governments to go into large projects and real estate activities. So across Asia, you had a situation that monetary and fiscal tightening became the policy norm, while the financial sector was cleaned up in a rather hasty manner that further uh, exacerbated an already precarious financial sector situation. And here are the dilemmas I should, I should, I should say. Number one is, is um, you know, implementation of high interest rates. They actually made matters worse because debt servicing became even more difficult and burdensome. Second is uh, devaluation of regional currencies. Again, to me, they made matters worse because one, it made debt servicing and FX doubly difficult for local businesses. And two, it also made imports more expensive and that worsened inflation and competitiveness of local currencies. And finally, relying fully on a flexible exchange rate at the time was rather difficult because it reflected the large outflows of foreign exchange from the region. So it could, and it did aggravate uh, cost of doing business and it drove the inflationary spiral. So what happened then? So well, some economists opted to allow their exchange rates to move freely. Others began to rely more and more on macro potential measures. And for one economy, a focused system of capital controls. Uh, no, I don't think we have completely overcome all of these challenges, especially in the light of the uh, global uh, pandemic. Now, in the case of uh, the GFC, uh, Sinyong, it was rather external to us, and the heat on the region was rather modest compared to what the Asian financial crisis inflicted on us. So I think I would, I would stop there. Hmm. Thank you, DJ Diwa. Um, well, you know, as you already kind of uh, mentioned that uh, you know, the exchange rate volatility remains a, a big issue. Uh, it's also because of the uh, still continued the dollar dependence in the region. I would like to invite Professor Kawai. Dollar dependence has been one of the major vulnerability facing uh, ASEAN plus three economies. And uh, in your chapter, um, you gave uh, some background for the uh, dollar dependency in the region, including the size of the U.S. economy, abundant liquidity, and the status of the uh, U.S. Fed Reserve. But um, in your view, what is the most important change we need to make to reduce this uh, vulnerability and then uh, also the region's um, uh, dependence on the U.S. dollar? Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, again for inviting me to this uh, very important uh, occasion. Uh, uh, myself and uh, Professor uh, Hiro Ito uh, wrote a chapter on uh, US dollar uh, dominance uh, in ASEAN plus three. So uh, the US dollar is uh, very dominant uh, because of uh, good uh, reasons. Uh, the currency is the most uh, trusted uh, currency in the world. Uh, dollar-based financial markets are uh, very liquid, very large, uh, and uh, its breadth uh, is, uh, is amazing. And everybody uses uh, the dollar, so uh, other people also uh, use uh, the dollar. 
uh, so overcoming uh, this uh, situation uh, is very uh, difficult. Uh, it's not uh, easy. I think uh, uh, ASEAN plus three economies uh, have been making step-by-step -step progress toward uh, moving away from the US dollar, but the process uh, is uh, very slow naturally because of the attractiveness of using the US dollar. So what, what can ASEAN plus three economies do uh, to reduce dollar dependence? Uh, I think uh, the most important step would be uh, to uh, strengthen uh, the financial markets of individual economies. Uh, ASEAN plus three economies have to deepen uh, their financial markets. Uh, they have to beef up uh, liquidity and breadth. Uh, uh, that would enable uh, those economies to further open up uh, the financial markets and capital account. Uh, and the costs due to capital account opening would become less if your financial markets uh, become stronger, deeper, uh, and, and broader uh, with a higher uh, amount of uh, liquidity. So that's, I think, uh, the, the, the most important uh, direction. Uh, but but uh, it takes time. So one cannot immediately jump away from US dollar dependence towards regional currency use. So uh, for the time being, uh, the ASEAN plus three economies have to continue to uh, uh, strengthen a policy framework uh, uh, to manage uh, US dollar dominant international monetary system. In other words, uh, large capital outflows and inflows would take place, uh, putting pressure on the financial markets of indiv individual economies. So uh, each economy would have to strengthen a policy framework for macro and financial stability. And at the same time, the region continues to need to strengthen uh, financial safety net, uh, including uh, financial surveillance to prevent or at least reduce uh, the impact, global uh, impacts of uh, external shocks on ASEAN plus three economies and, and at the same time, uh, not to create a uh, homemade financial crisis. Thank you, Professor Kawai. Well, you know, it's very important to uh, continue to deepen the domestic capital markets and also develop uh, national financial systems. And one of the key weakness in Asian uh, financial markets and systems have been uh, lack of uh, institutional investor base. And uh, in chapter six of the book, um, Gloria, you have discussed the challenges facing uh, pension funds. And can you kindly elaborate the necessary pension reforms to uh, develop the financial system and also strengthen financial resilience in the region? Yeah, thank you for that question, Simeon. Yeah, the, the pension reforms that I discussed in the, in the book, in the chapter, pertains to the three major issues. I, I can mention just three major issues that are challenges for the pension systems all over the world, actually, but in this region, particularly. And this pertains to the adequacy of pension benefits and sustainability of uh, pension funds uh, and the retirement benefits, and also on the coverage on the coverage of, uh, of retirees uh, of the population in this region. So um, in the past, there had been an easier way for pension systems to, to meet their um, their responsibilities uh, or meeting the payments for, for the beneficiaries because of high interest rates. But over the past few years, this decade since the global financial crisis, the low interest rates environment made it very difficult for them to meet the, the necessary income to give the appropriate returns for their, for, for their beneficiaries. So um, what, what happened was 
for them to, to um, diversify their portfolio more and more into so-called alternatives. And alternatives refer to private equity, hedge funds, infrastructure financing, et cetera. And in the process, they were able to, to, in, to increase their, their income and not to rely so much more on the very low income, low interest rates bearing government securities. So this refers to the meeting the challenge of adequacy. How do you make the future income of, of the retirees be adequate for them? Um, so I think one lesson that is derived from this experience is perhaps the, the flexibility in, 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 the, in the investment decisions of the pension systems, because in many countries, in many pension systems in the region, there is still this very rigid or inflexible caps on, on the type of investments where they can, you know, where they can put the, the pension systems, the, the pension funds are. So it's, I mean, reasonably, it can be understood because they are very highly regulated. There's a lot of concern that they cannot lose money, et cetera. But uh, there also need to be a little bit of flexibility in, in the decisions that they make in terms of where to put the, their, their portfolio, you know, their, their, in, their investments. Um, uh, and second is the question on uh, sustainability. And then the sustainability also um, tries to, to address the issue of longevity and the population aging in this, in this uh, region. And um, one, of the, one of the issues there is uh, how, to, how to ensure that the, that the retiree benefits could last longer. And I think some of the um, rules that some countries are using is to have stricter withdrawals of retirement benefits. They can adjust withdraw it ahead of their retirement age. And also um, in terms of adjusting the retirement ages in this region, um, majority have about 60 to 65 years of retirement, but others have still a younger age of retirement. And I think there are, you know, there are issues, there are uh, conversations on still adjusting those retirement age. The other issue is on the coverage. How do you increase the number of people that are covered by by the pension system. In many developed countries, almost 90% of the population are covered by social security institutions. But in this region, it is very low. It is very low coverage. So um, there, is, there is need to really discuss on how to cover people who are in the informal sector, for example, or more and more people who are in the gig, um, who are gig workers, who don't have the formal, they don't have standard employment and therefore they are not covered with the formal social security system. Uh, and then of course, another issue, especially for lower developed economies and who are just starting to introduce social security arrangements, um, the reforms, we cannot really talk about reforms, but rather we have to talk about capacity building in terms of management and, uh, and the administration of pension schemes and how to even run it, how to do investments how to, how to, and even also for those that already are in existence for a number of years, there is still the challenge of adopting technology in order to digitalize more of their systems and to improve the management of their investment portfolios. So these are some of the lessons and some of the experiences that um, are, are useful, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Well, back to uh, DigiDiwa, you know, you also mentioned this, uh, um, challenges that uh, we faced earlier uh, in the crisis. And, you know, I was actually thinking a lot of these challenges mentioned, uh, giving a deja vu <laughs> uh, moment uh, during the pandemic, the inflation has been kept very low. And then it's been really ex extended period of a very, very low interest rate, which now come up as a high inflation uh, the region has experienced as a price inflation, the property price rising. You know, we face a orderly exit from this uh, extraordinary monetary and fiscal policy support. Now, in the meantime, the you know, you know, regional and global financial landscape has changed enormously. We are now seeing a much more interconnected the banking systems. And uh, we have seen the rise of uh, systemically important banks, both in the region and also above the regional uh, uh, boundary. Can you 
can you share with us what kind of uh, challenges and, and uh, risks these uh, systemically important regional banks pose to our um, you know, the monetary uh, and the macro prudential policy measures during the uh, uh, exit from uh, this uh, uh, extraordinary uh, policy support period? Let me contextualize uh, my answer, Sin Yong. Uh, in one of the uh, chapters uh, that were written uh, in terms of uh, the concentration risks uh, in the process of uh, uh, the various economies uh, in the region uh, borrowing uh, <clears throat> to fund their business activities, recovery efforts, uh, et cetera. And you know, economies uh, in the region can be subject of uh, concentration risks when they are exposed uh, to broadly the same set of banks that are also interconnected. And uh, this is what you were referring to as, uh, in fact, if not globally, uh, it could be regionally, systemically important uh, banks. For example, among the Asia 9, uh, uh, Asia 9 uh, three of the large borrowers, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and uh, Thailand, uh, and, and the Philippines rather, uh, their most important sources of cross-border uh, loans were Japanese banks, and they relied heavily for those loans of banks in the UK, US, and of course from uh, Taipei, China. The problem with this so-called uh, common lender channel of uh, contagion is that during the crisis, they could reduce their exposure and in the process affect the borrowing countries uh, accordingly. Now, true, ASEAN plus three countries have recovered lost ground during the global financial crisis in terms of strong growth, better current account uh, position, etc. However, central banks around the region have accumulated large FX reserves and they have also organized a CMIM. These are the positive uh, developments, but the region has more things to do when it comes to what uh, Dr. Remolona uh, describe as slow barn uh, contagion due precisely to some concentration risks deriving from this systemically important uh, banks. Now, the, 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 the book offers two options to further mitigate the concentration risk of this type of contagion. One is macroprudential measures. Okay? Restrictions against borrowing abroad, for example, can be mandated. Other macroprudential measures include the loan to value ratio and banks required reserves. Capital buffers may also be implemented. Now, what the book talked talk about is that doing the capital conservation levy, for example, a, a form of uh, macroprudential measure on a transparent basis and imposed on foreign loans from banks that come from certain jurisdictions that are basically concentrated and interconnected could also be destabilizing. Now, the other option is designated, designating regional systemically important banks rather than just relying completely on the global systemically important banks. I think the idea here is to impose additional capital buffers on their bank subsidiaries in the region. Now, such buffers are, are supposed to be calibrated to discourage precisely slow burn contagion concentration risks across the region. Now, given the significance of RCIBs, uh, which have assets and liabilities in uh, multiple currencies across different uh, jurisdictions, it may be pertinent to begin exploring the use of cross-border collateral arrangements to help regional institutions deal, for example, with liquidity issues. Thank you very much, uh, Senor. Well, thank you. Well, uh, that was very interesting to hear, you know, the, the collateralized the local currencies. Um, and uh, the Professor Kawai, you actually mentioned the, the local currency settlement framework as an important step uh, for more uh, regional currency system that can reduce currency risks. What uh, what is the potential of this? And then uh, what, what kind of challenges do we face in uh, taking this step? 
Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, the local uh, currency settlement framework has been developed uh, by several central banks uh, among ASEAN countries like uh, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, and recently the Philippines uh, has joined. And bilaterally, uh, Japan and China uh, have been uh, arranging, uh, making uh, similar arrangements uh, bilaterally with uh, uh, like Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand. Uh, so the, the idea is uh, to encourage the use of uh, local currencies for the settlements of trade and foreign direct investment. Uh, well, the idea is, uh, is a good idea. Uh, how to translate uh, this good idea uh, into uh, reality? Is, uh, is a big, uh, big challenge. Uh, what uh, uh, they have done uh, 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 has been uh, to identify uh, uh, certain banks as uh, foreign currency data banks uh, 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 appointed uh, in each country. And these banks can trade uh, partner currencies in their uh, own domestic markets, like uh, Thai banks uh, trading uh, uh, ringgit uh, within Thailand, uh, and similarly, Malaysia uh, uh, trading uh, the Thai baht uh, within uh, the, the Malaysian market. So, so, uh, so this would uh, require substantial liberalization of foreign exchange regulations and, and rules uh, which is, uh, I, I believe, uh, which is good. Uh, but uh, uh, in order to make sure that uh, direct trading uh, among currencies to take place, like uh, the baht and ringgit, uh, baht and peso, uh, the uh, transaction cost for bilateral uh, transactions will have to be less than the cost of going through the US dollar. You know, usually the peso is converted into the US dollar and then uh, converted into the baht uh, because the cost of using the US dollar is uh, very low. So, so the challenge is, uh, you know, how to make uh, transactions big so that uh, bilateral uh, currency trading uh, does actually take place. Uh, this is a big, uh, big challenge. And, and also, uh, so far, uh, trade and foreign direct investment are the eligible transactions. I think uh, to further uh, deepen the market, more substantially capital flows would have to be uh, would have to become eligible. Uh, so, so we are proposing that uh, local currency bond investment uh, had better be uh, be settled uh, in local. Uh, lo local currencies, which is which is very very natural, right? Uh, and other investment uh, also, uh, even uh, 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 bank, uh, you know, uh, bank uh, 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 loans uh, uh, among Asian banks, uh, uh, cross border loans are conducted typically in the U.S. dollar. In the case of Japanese banks, yen is uh, is uh, is used, but uh, still the U.S. dollar is, is dominant. So, so still a lot of uh, a lot of challenges uh, do remain. Uh, the, uh, the most important uh, thing is to reduce the cost of bilateral uh, and direct uh, trading of uh, regional currencies. Thank you, Kawaii. Uh, I believe uh, DG Diwa has uh, any comments back on Yeah, uh, I agree completely with uh, Professor uh, Kawaii uh, about the use of local currency. Uh, however, uh, it will be also a function of uh, the volume of uh, transactions, both uh, merchandise trade and uh, services between and among the participating uh, countries. That's one. Second, I don't know if uh, netting uh, and the participation of uh, central banks in the settlement of all of these uh, 
uh, transactions in the local currency uh, will help. Uh, after all, um, uh, the digital platform is always available and that could also provide uh, some uh, moderation in terms of uh, the cost of settling uh, the use of uh, these uh, local currencies. Thank you very much. Gloria, you also have uh, any feedback? I have a comment on, on the collateralized um, um, financing that uh, that uh, uh, Diwa mentioned earlier, and I found it very interesting. So it's, this is just really a comment because it's it's something related to the challenges in the trade area. So, for example, in trade financing, very often it's collateralized by an asset. You know, for example, the goods itself. Uh, but um, even here in trade financing, the challenge is really how do you really get a hold on that particular asset? You know, when anything goes wrong. So the, the existence of the necessary asset-based uh, financing law have to be present. So, you know, I think it's a very interesting idea, but you'll have to take a look at the existing um, ecosystem, the existing legal infrastructure, whether, you know, how, how those collateral uh, are, are going to be available for, especially for international um, lenders. A very interesting idea, actually. Yeah, thank you, Gloria. Well, we have some questions actually uh, from the audience uh, for uh, Professor Kawai. You know, they, you mentioned that the uh, domestic financial market needs to be strengthened uh, to have uh, less uh, dollar dependency in the region. But do you think the differences in economic and financial development across the region can actually slow our de dependency? How fast can we achieve uh, the reduction or autonomy of our uh, local currencies in the region? Uh, I, uh, I did not get to the question clearly. Uh, the low degree of financial development with a slow dependency, US dollar dependency? Does yeah, that mean? dollar dependency, ah, our ah, dependency on the US dollar. Ah, ah, I see, okay. So, so if uh, you open up uh, the financial uh, market, uh, of course, uh, people can use uh, foreign currency or domestic currency, it's up to uh, the private, uh, private agents. Uh, so, uh, but uh, if uh, the degree of uh, financial market uh, uh, development is very low and closed, uh, the market is closed, then of course, naturally uh, cross-border transactions would be less. But uh, that, that doesn't mean that the local currency would be used for international uh, mm -hmm. transactions. For those countries, typically uh, for international transactions, the most dominant uh, global currency today, the US dollar, tends to be used, or maybe in, in uh, countries close to the, to the Eurozone, the Euro uh, would become uh, a dominant, uh, do dominant currency. That, that's what uh, we observe. So uh, as countries uh, strengthen their financial markets, there is huge potential for those countries' currencies to be used for international transactions particularly if countries make efforts to internationalize their currencies, uh, which uh, Japan, uh, China, and even Thailand uh, did. Thailand uh, did that in the early 1990s. Unfortunately, that led to an excessive uh, inflows of uh, capital into Bangkok and Thailand. Uh, but uh, but uh, the Thai baht, is a very important currency in the Indochina uh, uh, trade. Uh, so, uh, so the Thai uh, financial market is, is uh, most uh, developed uh, financial market in the Indochina uh, continent, uh, in the Indochina part of uh, uh, ASEAN. Uh, so naturally the baht uh, has become a very important, uh, important currency. So, so, so still, I, I believe that uh, developing uh, uh, and strengthening uh, domestic financial markets uh, is a very important uh, condition for the country's uh, increasing use of, of uh, own domestic uh, currencies. 
Thank you. Well, uh, Digidiwa, the fintech application has uh, emerged as a strong uh, in the alternative solutions for financial inclusion uh, during the pandemic, actually. Um, do you see other like emerging challenges related to uh, fintech development? Well, uh, the, the rapid rise of uh, fintech globally and uh, within the region cannot be ignored because of their implications on financial inclusion and uh, financial stability. Uh, Shin Yong earlier made mention of uh, the benefits of fintech like uh, efficiency, transparency, convenience, financial transactions, etc. However, if uh, fintech is not properly harnessed, fintech activities could be accompanied by significant risks in terms of financial stability. For instance, uh, the development of uh, peer-to-peer or P2P lending could possibly impact the banking system by reducing both deposits and, uh, and loans. The rise of uh, private uh, crypto uh, currencies could potentially uh, destabilize the flow of credit domestically and you know, negatively uh, impact uh, the effectiveness of conventional tools of uh, monetary policy. So there is much scope for mutual learning and sharing of experiences across uh, countries in the region, all of which are faced with these uh, challenges. So we should, I think, uh, balance the benefits of financial innovations with the possible costs associated with the pursuit of uh, financial stability. Big techs and uh, fintechs backed by established corporates also pose regulatory challenges. Uh, regulators need to recalibrate uh, their policy frameworks to better equip themselves to deal with specific types of uh, systemic and contagion risks arising from interconnected activities of uh, the big techs. Thank you. Well, um, there was another question I believe uh, can be uh, probably directed to all of you. The pandemic uh, especially uh, started as the health crisis now turned into a huge economic and humanitarian crisis. Global growth has been hampered, leaving millions of workers unemployed and uh, fallen back into poverty. Now, what are the policy responses that uh, we can do collectively uh, by ASEAN economies? So can I, uh, in, uh, can I maybe present this to uh, Professor Kawaii and uh, you can uh, you know, maybe uh, use this as uh, your wrap up statement. <laughs> <laughs> key, key suggestions and then the policy options. Well, uh, uh, the, the, the question, uh, the, the question may be related to the regions uh, uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the ASEAN plus three vision, right? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, I think uh, the individual countries have been doing an uh, excellent uh, response at the national level to mitigate the negative impacts on, on corporate businesses and household uh, incomes severely affected uh, by the pandemic. So, uh, so national responses uh, have been good uh, responses, I, I, I think. Now, collectively, uh, if uh, many countries do it together uh, and expand uh, fiscal spending uh, for the purpose of uh, supporting corporate and household uh, uh, activities, the impact, collective impact would be much bigger because of interdependence in the region. So uh, uh, the multiplier uh, impact uh, for the region as a whole uh, would, be, uh, would be large. So, uh, so perhaps uh, 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 ASEAN plus three uh, finance ministers and central bank governors, uh, 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 when they got together, they talked about the national responses uh, the uh, 
perhaps uh, they could have uh, uh, have said more if uh, you know collectively uh, they pursue uh, fiscal or uh, uh, fiscal expansion and a monetary expansion then the collective impact would be bigger uh, and uh, and uh, that would also uh, have a uh, global impact too because the ASEAN plus three economy is already the largest uh, economic grouping in the world. It's, it's, uh, it's really uh, amazing. Uh, ASEAN plus three has uh, a total of 25 uh, trillion uh, US dollars uh, in terms of nominal GDP. Uh, the US, is US has 21 trillion, uh, the European Union uh, about 18 or so. So uh, the collective uh, action uh, within ASEAN plus three would have a, a good impact, not only on the region, but, but also on the global economy. There's just one more question I thought like it might be very, uh, um, you know, uh, that might be very relevant to your uh, research. Like, do you see a local currency swap arrangement among ASEAN countries can help the financial resilience in the future? Are, are you asking me? Yes. Okay. You are the yeah. expert. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Local uh, currency well, swap if, arrangement uh, among right. uh, Asian economies. Right. If uh, if uh, ASEAN ASEAN countries can increase the use of local currencies, uh, then they can um, protect uh, more themselves against uh, external shocks. When external shocks like uh, global financial crisis, taper tantrum, capital outflows do take place, and uh, many countries would be in need of. Uh, uh, international liquidity for conducting uh, uh, international uh, businesses and protecting themselves against uh, external shocks. If uh, local currencies can play that role, then uh, you know uh, the use of uh, local currencies would uh, be a big plus for them. Thank you. Well, um, can I give? Uh... Also now floor to uh, the uh, DG Diwa. What could be your final sort of uh, takeaways and suggestions for the ASEAN uh, policymakers in response to the COVID and then recovery? Well, I, I agree with uh, Professor uh, Kawai that uh, there is a really a, a, a big need for collective statement of uh, the regional intent on at least uh, three issues. One is uh, rolling out an exit strategy from the health pandemic. I think uh, <clears throat> while uh, we're still in the middle of the pandemic, we should start looking at the post-pandemic uh, period. And of course here, uh, we have to collectively uh, um, come together and address the issue of expansion and quicker rollout of vaccines stronger uh, system of uh, the usual testing, contact tracing, isolating, etc. Because uh, if we have a strong uh, type of this kind of system, we would be able to go into more granular rather than generalized lockdown and in the process penalize uh, the economy. Uh, second is I think we have to uh, uh, expect uh, the uh, central bank uh, governors and finance ministers, and of course, uh, their leaders of the ASEAN plus three to come together and make a statement about managing sovereign debt and financial risks. I think it is important because we know what happened in the last uh, two years. Uh, the debt uh, issue has become more serious. Mm -hmm. uh, the fiscal deficit has gone up. The debt to GDP ratio has uh, also expanded and that could also affect market sentiment and in the process, uh, market confidence. So I think uh, uh, a statement on managing sovereign debt and financial risks is also in order. And third, I think the commitment should also be indicated on rebuilding a more resilient regional economy. Uh, it is important that uh, some statement is made 
about the commitment of these countries to infrastructure, both uh, uh, po uh, both the uh, hard and the uh, soft uh, infrastructure, uh, structural reforms and investment. We were saying earlier that there is no substitute to undertaking policy and structural reforms, even through uh, this health uh, this health pandemic. And social safety nets should also be strengthened to support the transition. The point I believe is to address the challenge of shortening the recovery time of prospective regional economies from economic scaring and restoring public confidence in the economic prospects. I think that is key to a more sustained, sustainable and inclusive economic growth. I think AMRO has a lot of uh, things to do uh, to be able to uh, uh, serve as a forum for stronger uh, regional uh, surveillance, also as a secretariat to uh, operationalize uh, the CMIM in case some regional liquidity will be required in the process. Thank you very much, uh, Sinyong. Thank you. Well, Gloria, any uh, final? Yes. Um, I feel I agree with the word. You, yes. you can yes. just uh, have uh, one minute. <laughs> yes, I agree with both of my co-panelists, um, you know, interventions, but um, in terms of the fiscal, um, you know, fiscal health and also on the social protection side. But I think I, I'll add one more, basically to open the, the economy um, uh, as soon as possible, because you don't know how, how far the, the economy can still withstand all the restrictions on the on the movement process, and particularly on the trade front. This is where my addition is going to be. The while the goods the goods trade have rebounded more quickly, the services trade have been more adversely affected because more of the services trade require proximity between buyer and sellers, and uh, many of the services um, sectors like uh, retail, travel, transport have really plunged uh, during this period. And it's very important that opening up of the economy could be, it could take place as soon as possible, as soon as possible. Um, and this is true also even for, for services sectors like financial services that are already relatively more digitalized, but they still have, you know, have, have problems because the proximity is important between buyer and seller. And I think probably the second thing is to, to upgrade infrastructure, telecommunications infrastructure, because the COVID really highlighted the importance of, of, uh, of the digital infrastructure. And I think more and more, the countries have to prepare for more usage. Of, of the digital infrastructure going forward. So it is very important that uh, this infrastructure be strengthened and also to, to have more capacity so that the, the people, even in the remotest part of the countries would be able to access this dig digital infrastructure. So I think those are my additional um, you know, comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all uh, speakers and the panelists uh, who joined uh, our webinar today. I hope uh, this webinar gave us some glints of the book, which detail all that analysis uh, behind this uh, uh, in very uh, interactive, uh, interesting discussion today. Um, we are very pleased to uh, finish this uh, webinar on a very high note as a final issue of the Asia Impact webinar this year. In 2022, uh, we will have two Asia Impact webinars on 19 January, Wednesday. First, it will be at 11.30. Uh, the webinar will be on ADB's knowledge journey, the role of research and collaboration with VP Bambang Susantono and ADB's new chief economist, Albert Park. And second one, it will be at the 9.30 uh, p.m. We have the pleasure of hosting Professor Darren Asimoglu from MIT to ADB's Distinguished Speakers Program. Everyone can also join uh, after the wonderful holidays. Thank you very much. <laughs>